Welcome to everyone. I would like to salute and warmly thank you everyone for being here, especially our guest lecturer for today, my good friend Christos Marneros. Before I hand over to Christos, I would like to quickly introduce him to you guys. Christos Marneros is a lecturer in law at Lincoln Law School, University of Lincoln, UK, and visiting lecturer in Legal Philosophy Riga Graduate School of Law, Latvia. His current research focuses on the intersections between political theory, legal theory, and continental philosophy. In particular, his research seeks to question and examine how anarchic thought can disturb the law, the state, and the police, both as an institution and as a mode of being and thinking. His monograph, titled Human Rights After Deleuze, Towards an Anarchic Jurisprudence to be published by Hart Publishing Bloomsbury in November 22. Today, as a guest of LabTest, UAPG, Christos is going to present a research in which he works out some concepts of Max Stirner and Cornelius Castoriadis on the themes of subjectivity, political autonomy, and society. His presentation is titled Towards the Autonomous Nothing, a Call for the Destitution of the Law. Dear Christus, you have the word, and we are all ears. Thank you once more for being with us, my friend. Thank you very much, Murillo. Thank you for inviting me, and thank you, everyone, for being here. Uh, hopefully, you will find the, the paper interesting and the ideas. Uh, please feel free to comment and uh, agree or disagree with anything that I say. I'm uh, very open to ideas because it's a very new uh area of research and uh, quite um uh, it's, it's it's a very new beginning in a sense so i don't know if uh the ideas that i present together they fit or uh there is something that doesn't fit so i'll be uh, very happy to hear any points about the paper so um the idea behind this, this paper and the examination of these two thinkers, Max Stirner and Cornelius Castoriadis, uh, started nearly, let's say, the end of my PhD almost two years ago. So uh, I was um, editing my PhD in order to publish it as a book, the book that Murillo mentioned. And uh, my PhD and now the book uh, engages mostly with uh, with the thought of Gilles Deleuze. I'm sure you've examined uh, some of his uh, ideas and works uh, in the lab. Uh, if not, and if you want to ask anything about Deleuze, I'm also happy to, to talk about him as he's a big, huge kind of figure in my, uh, in my work. Um, so um, when I was examining Deleuze, I was I was familiar with with the ideas of Stirner, uh, but uh, and from Deleuze because Deleuze read Stirner actually, and this is another interesting uh, point. Uh, if you read, uh, for example, his Nietzsche book, he has a, a very short uh, footnote on Stirner, where he uh, highlights. Uh, the similarities, and he praises also Stirner, the similarities between Nietzsche and Stirner, and praises Stirner. But in his uh, logic of sense, uh, he has another footnote about Stirner, so two footnotes on Stirner, from Zeles, where, uh, again, he, at the beginning, he praises Stirner for um, uh, showing that there is an issue with transcendence, in Western thought, so this idea of God uh, became actually the idea of the human being. So with the Enlightenment uh, thinking, uh, we have this critique of the divine, but this critique of the divine did not go all the way, according to Deleuze and Stirner and many other thinkers, because we simply uh, replace this idea of the divine with the idea of humanity. So humanity became the central uh, transcendent entity of Western thought, according to Deleuze. And this is the reason uh, why Deleuze uh, thinks that Stirner is an interesting figure. However, uh, he briefly says that he 
even Stirner didn't go all the way, but he doesn't explain why. So this short shortcoming explanation was something that made me uh, engage more uh, with the ideas of Stirner, but also in, uh, in the Anglo-American world, and especially in the works of Saul Newman, uh, Stirner um, became a prominent figure again for uh, post-structuralist post uh, anarchist thought, mostly. So, uh, uh, Saul Newman, for example, uh, works a lot on Stirner in order to present a post-anarchic account of, uh, of political theory and, and philosophy, uh, which is not exactly what I try to do with Stirner, but again, this was another, let's say, uh, something that triggered uh, further my interest into uh, Stirner's thought. Uh, now, the other figure, Cornelius Castoriadis, I don't know if you're familiar with, uh, with him or any of his of his uh, notions of autonomy, heteronomy, uh, direct and radical democracy, mostly less familiar. Okay, he is quite familiar. he was quite known in in Latin America. I'm not sure about Brazil, but uh, I think he had some he had some discussions with other, with some Argentinian anarchist for some reason uh, in a radio station. Uh, the book is a very short book published in Greek, uh, I think only in Greek. Uh, but I don't know why he's not that uh, he's not that known in Brazil, which is usually the first country in Latin America where we get to know to know the thinkers. But yeah, he had this very random discussion with Argentinian, and they don't they don't even mention their names or their group or anything. It's just Argentinian anarchists of some sort anyway so cornelius castoriadis uh, is a greek french uh, philosopher psychoanalyst economist uh, political theorist uh, at some point he worked also in a high in a high, in a high position at the organization of economic cooperation and development which is something that led to multiple critiques from the left in Greece. So you know, if you know the organization, it's pretty much a very neoliberal sort of organization. Um, to be fair with him, he worked there uh, when the organization uh, started. So perhaps it wasn't you know, this uh, behemoth of neoliberalism as it is today in Europe. And uh, to be fair, he said, he said also that he hated that job, but uh, the job helped him to understand another important concept of his thought, that of bureaucracy. So his very famous book, uh, The Imaginary Institution of the Society. So it's a, it's a long book where he criticizes uh, bureaucracy and the Soviet Union as a bureaucratic state. Uh, draws a lot of influence from his, from his experiences uh, in the organization, which he, uh, he quitted after he acquired the French uh, citizenship. So um, it was a bit also, he, he had to work in a, you know, in, in, a, in a normal kind of organization as an immigrant who didn't have uh, a citizenship in France. He was in danger if he was to, to be sent back to Greece because after the, the Greek Civil War, uh, communists uh, were persecuted, uh, killed, imprisoned, sent to uh, islands and so forth. So a lot of them left uh, mostly for France. And also Castoriadis was under the danger of the Communist Party of Greece, which was uh, Stalinist influenced at the time. Uh, whereas um, he, he belonged to a group called archeo marxists So it's a group, uh, they, they are called like that because they were publishing a, a periodical called Archeo, Archeo, Archeo of, of Marxism. So Archeo is an archive of Marxism. So Archeo-Marxists 
uh, was a, a group of Marxists uh, who were influenced by Trotsky, but they weren't exactly Orthodox Trotskyists at the time, but anyway, uh, he, he belonged to this group, Castoriadis. So, of course, he wasn't welcome from the official, let's say, Communist Party, which was uh, influenced by, by Stalin. He was run, actually, by a guy uh, called Dimitriadis, who had personal um, fr friendly relations with Stalin himself. So if he was to be sent back to Greece, he was going to uh, get killed or imprisoned or whatever. So it, was, it wasn't that easy for him. So perhaps the reason that he opted to work in that kind of organization was strategical, of course, and we need to understand that despite the many criticism coming from um, many figures from the left, like uh, Nikos Poulanzas, if you are familiar with the famous uh, theorist of uh, the state and dictatorship, another uh, Greek-French, uh, mostly Orthodox Marxist for international lawyers. Uh, if, there are, if there are any here, uh, he's quite influential figure. Um, but anyway, so yeah, Castoriadis, uh, or the reason that I'm using Castoriadis, and I'll, I will arrive to the point where I will explain why I think there is something interesting in working with Stirner and Castoriadis, albeit there are many differences, is because uh, this concept of autonomy, uh, I think that it has a lot to say and to offer to an, anar an anarchic thought that can correspond to our contemporary issues and problems. Um, in Greece, for example, despite that Castoriadis was a figure belonging uh, to the left, he uh, he is more familiar to anarchist circles. And I think that has to do with the fact that he worked a lot with this notion of, of autonomy and direct democracy to some extent. But uh, I think the most, uh, the most significant concept for people engaging with anar anarchic and anarchist practices and thought is this concept of autonomy, which he uses in order to counter uh, what he conceives of as the main issue of Western thought, and that is uh, the notion of heteronomy. And as I will explain in the paper, uh, heteronomy uh, is, let's say, the main issue that um, defines Western thought. So why Stirner and Castoriadis? So, uh, I think that uh, this critique of, of, of transcendence, transcendence is a concept used by Deleuze, but in, in Stirner, for example, we got, we got some uh, mentions of, of the transcendent, not the transcendental, the transcendent or transcendence, um, or the or the Geist of Hegel, he's quite critical of Hegel, he, he belonged to the circle of young Hegelians. If, if you saw uh, the only uh, depiction of Hegel, of, of, uh, sorry, of Stirner that we have, is uh, a sketch by Engels, uh, there is a very, uh, very famous sketch of the, of the young Hegelians fighting, and Stirner is the guy, don't give it a fuck, don't give him a fuck about what's going on, but rather he's there and smoking behind everyone, and, you know, Marx is in front fighting the others. And also he's the guy that uh, Marx uh, and Engels uh, mock in the German ideology. They say somewhere about Saint Marx, where he don't get uh, the reality, or I think the material conditions of, uh, of what's going on, and he's uh, preoccupied with his spooks in a sense. But I think they 
they are uh, they don't do justice to Stirner, uh, in my view. I think Stirner uh, was very far, far beyond in terms of understanding uh, certain issues of of, uh, of Western tradition in philosophy and in terms of thinking. And uh, this very important uh, notion that he used, uh, that he uses that of the spooks or the phantoms or the ghosts, in order to explain that we base our very thoughts and ideas on external uh, notions such as God, humanity, justice, rights. So in my, in my book, I criticize this overemphasis on this idea of human rights as a, as a sort of morality, external kind of morality, for example. And this is another um, point that led me to uh, examine more uh, Stirner's, uh, Stirner's thought. So with Stirner, we have this critique of the ghosts, of the spooks, and Castoriadis, we have this critique of Hederonom. And this is, these are the two points that I find quite similar uh, in their thoughts, in their very different kind of accounts, uh, the very different traditions that they belong to. Stirner, 19th century uh, Germany, um, Castoriadis, uh, 20th century, mostly France, in terms of you know, the, the tradition and Greece to some extent. Uh, different preoccupations, different reasons for arguing what they argued. Uh, different followers as well. I mean, you won't find a lot of people uh, working with Castoriadis and Stirner at the same time um, for many reasons. Uh, I mean, leftists usually, especially in some circle, uh, circles in Greece, they consider Stirner as a reactionary figure. And to a certain extent, uh, this is understandable because in, in his only book, uh, The Unique and Its Property, there are some uh, troubling issues as well. And we need to acknowledge that despite all the great ideas, there are some sexist remarks, and racist remarks as well. So uh, we, we, should, we should, of course, acknowledge that and emphasize that if we want to engage seriously with what he does. But uh, I think, uh, yeah, I think that is, um, is not enough and it's not just to say we don't engage with his thought at all because there are these things. I think what Sol Newman did with uh, the fact that he reintroduced him into a radical thought, uh, especially anarchic thought, is very useful for our uh, contemporary ways of thinking and engaging with, with anarchism and anarchy. And uh, yeah, so we have that, and Castoriadis on the other is, is, is a figure of the left, albeit all the criticism that I mentioned earlier about the fact that uh, to the um, organization of uh, economic development uh, in the economic cooperation and development he he's he's a traditional uh, figure of the left uh, per se so you won't find any reactionary thinkers using castoriadis but especially in the us you will find uh, reactionary uh, quite racist as well thinkers engaging with with stirner and uh, some uh, libertarians or so-called anarcho-capitalists as they tend to um, <clears throat> introduce themselves which is uh, i think a contradiction and an absurdity to say so so uh, are there any questions or something that you'd like me to um, say about the backgrounds before i get, got, I get into the actual paper. Are there any uh, something about the thinkers, about the idea behind uh, this? No. And until this point, it's very clear, Christos. Thanks. Thanks, Maria. Okay. So uh, my paper now. 
So what I try to do here, and again, I said this is quite new and quite experimental uh, paper. I try to uh, use Stirner's concept or notion of the spooks or the ghost and Castoriadis' uh, notion and critique of heteronomy. And I'm using also uh, his notion of autonomy in order to um, offer a critique of the law, not only as an institution, but also as an idea, as a higher kind of idea that dictates our uh, ways of being and thinking, let's say. So uh, my ultimate aim, and I briefly mentioned that, I mentioned that in the paper, is to uh, draw a destituent account. So this uh, another the, the concept of the destitution. If you are familiar with it, was briefly explained uh, by Giorgio Agamben, who was influenced by Walter Benjamin in his critical violence piece. He talks about the need to break the, uh, the will uh, of the law and the state and so forth. And this is what Agamben uh, interpreted as a call of destitution. Uh, also, and more recently, in, uh, in the book Now by the Invisible Committee, we have an explanation of this notion of the destitution. Uh, the other collective uh, and the journal Hostis, they published a, a history of the use of the destitution in a journal called Destituencies that was last year, I think. And it is a very useful chronology of how the term uh, develops. And I drew some, uh, some influence from these ideas, but I'm trying to use this concept of the destitution in order to uh, emphasize a need, let's say, to do away with law. So I'm starting with these two thinkers in order to arrive at this point where I uh, have, let's say, this call for the destitution of the law, as, as my title uh, says. So, inspired by Goethe's poem, uh, Vanitas, Max Stirner begins, begins his uh, 1844 uh, book, Der Einzig und uh, Sein Eigentum, which is uh, usually translated uh, in English as The Ego and Its Own, and more recently in a better translation, I think, uh, The Unique and Its Property, if anyone uh, knows German, uh, please uh, let me know which one sounds more uh, correct. Uh, by calling us to base our affair on nothing. So this is the first kind of uh, line or call by Stirner. He says that I have based my affair on nothing. Uh, this nothing, however, should not be read as a call to nihilism and as a total indifference to anything that goes about in our everydayness. So another issue is the fact that Stirner uh, is a huge influence for uh, nihilist and nihilistic kind of movements, either belonging to the anarchist tradition, because there are quite interesting accounts of uh, anarchists engaging with nihilism, but also reactionary figures as well. So even usually uh, uh, white, uh, uh, white fundamentalists and people like that as well. Uh, so we have this call for nothing, uh, mis misunderstood, let's say, as a call uh, to nihilism. But for me, it is rather an insurrectionary call to nothing, our masters, be that God, the law, the state, humanity, human rights, justice, and so forth. So the first thing that I identify, and I think it's useful, is a need to nothing. So this is an active kind of, of effort. We're trying to nothing. So we, 
we actively engage in an effort to nothing someone rather than say, okay, I don't care about anything. And everything can go to hell. Um, it is a realization that all these supposedly higher causes are in fact egotistical because they simply care for their self-sufficiency and preservation. So, uh, in the very uh, in the in the in the introduction of his book, Stirner starts in a very ir ironical manner to say that you know the Sultan doesn't care about you; he only cares about his uh, sarai, his palace, and whatever. So, he convinces you that he cares about you and the country and the motherland and whatever in order to fight for him and to preserve his authority. But in fact, he doesn't care about you. God cares only about getting all the, you know, the praise and uh, the prayers from, uh, from the believers, but actually he doesn't care about the believers. He cares about getting everything from the believers. So the believers are uh, just, uh, are just there in order to satisfy the egoism of God, the egoism of the Sultan, the egoism of the motherland. The motherland cares only about your blood, he says. So you are going to sacrifice yourself in order to free or uh, conquer more in the name of the motherland, in the name of the nation, and so forth. But in reality, according to Stirner, all these higher causes, or humanity, for example, you need to act in a certain way in the name of humanity just to, uh, just to show that you are a good, good person for the society and whatever. But in reality, all these, all these higher causes are egoistical, according to Stirner. And they have uh, also uh, this tendency to, uh, to accuse you of being an egoist if you don't care about the nation. If you say, I don't care about the nation, I don't care about the motherland, I understand that the war uh, I, I should not participate in a war in the name of the motherland because that war is there in order to satisfy set, certain um, uh, let's say uh, certain um, uh, what's the word now um, I mean to preserve the authority of certain people to, to satisfy their needs to satisfy what they want to achieve and it is not in fact something that you should uh, you, sh you should be bothered with in a sense so why do you sacrifice yourself in the name of an abstract uh, cause like nation for example and if you do if you say that all these higher causes and other people believing in these causes uh, will accuse you as an egoist or as someone who is not um, who is not, you know, a, a good a good citizen, for example, or a good person, or whatever. But in fact, Stirner says that we need to become egoists, not in this very neoliberal kind of uh, sense that we understand today, egoism or individualism or whatever. But in fact, we need we we need to become egoists in the sense that we need to nothing all these causes. So, uh, in order to achieve that, these higher values, so in order to achieve, uh, make, make us believe that these higher causes are important, these higher values present themselves as noble and benevolent, promising to every obedient subject, uh, which base its affair to the preservation of these values, the reward of the recognition, as the law-abiding citizen, for example, the pious believer, or the good human being. So, for example, if you sacrifice yourself for your motherland, in the best situation, you will get a statue or whatever, or they will send uh, uh, a medal to your family, or you know, well, all the common things that you get. Uh, of course, such a recognition uh, takes place after the total sacrifice of this obedient subject, and this sacrifice usually means that you are going to lose your life. Uh, to that extent, these higher causes effectively manage uh, to function, according to Stirner, as specters or spooks. So 
the, he uses the German word uh, spooky. Uh, that haunts every fabric of our existence and they dictate our lives. So they dictate the ways that we think and the ways uh, that we behave. Otherwise, you know, we are uh, called not only egoist, but also uh, deviant, uh, problematic, um, crazy, whatever, whatever you may think. Uh, coming from a very different theoretical milieu and offering a very different very different perspective on theory, philosophy, and politics, Cornelius Castoriadis makes some interestingly similar points to Stirner in relation to our over-reliance to external principles that dictate our modes of being. Castoriadis does so by the distinction that he makes between the notion of autonomy and that of heteronomy. So he understands autonomy, and I'm quoting, as the capacity of a society or an individual to act deliberately and explicitly in order to modify its law, that is to say, its form or nomos, so the Greek word for law, uh, which also has a lot of different meanings from, from our uh, English understanding of law, but this is another kind of, of story, end of quote. So, uh, here we get a first glimpse of what Castoriadis means by autonomy. So it's our capacity, our ability, let's say, to create and recreate uh, our nomi, our laws, not only in an institutional manner, but also in a way uh, that, it, that it talks about our own habits, our ways of life. So the way that we live, the way that we think. So instead of focusing on external uh, commands or orders from a higher authority, uh, we should, according to Castoriadis again, we should uh, um, try to think in terms of autonomy. That is, try to think uh, uh, in ways that uh, we create um, in a way that does not uh, uh, receive its commands by an external sort of authority. So it's rather um, a horizontal rather than vertical way of, of thinking and, uh, and belonging to the world. So we can see uh, from that the anarchic kind of, of sense or ethos in this kind of thinking. A way, it's a way of thinking and living that does not um, expect from any external a hierarchical notion to receive uh, its commands and, and its ideas. And this is, of course, something that we also see in Stirner, but also in Deleuze, if you are familiar with, uh, with his understanding of immanence, for example, in the way that he uh, counters uh, his philosophy of immanence to a philosophy of transcendence, for example. Okay, so uh, <clears throat> my understanding of, of the notion of autonomy is, let us, is, as I say, the ability of someone to disorient or cause a rupture to the sanctity of the given higher laws of the heteronomous societies that we live in. So this ability to act uh, in an autonomous way Obviously, as I will explain later, this is a difficult task, and this is the main difficulty that I have here, is what is to ask what does it mean to live and act within an autonomous, an autonomous life, let's say. But uh, in any way, I think that uh, an autonomous moment, which is possible to happen, is a rupture to uh, the everydayness of heteronomy that we live in. So the fact, for example, that, uh, I don't know, the usual tradition in universities is that I, I am there and speaking in my suit, and you know, and you sit there in your seats in a, in a particular way, uh, 
in some countries, the dean comes in and he or she welcomes me. You know, all the formalities that we get at the universities is, is a commonality of the way that universities act when we have uh, a guest speaker. So perhaps the fact that I, we, we speak in this very uh, chilled way and I can speak from Cyprus and you can listen to me in Brazil and we don't have all these formalities and all this stuff is a rupture to this, uh, to this heteronomous uh, forma formalism that we have in the, in the universities as institutions, for example. Me, I do not. This is just, uh, does it change something? Perhaps for some people, no. For others, yes, I mean, I feel much more comfortable and much more happy, <laughs> you know. Uh, not, not for not being there, but rather, you know, for having this uh, comfortable, chilled uh, discussion rather than formalities and me standing and talking whatever you know uh, <clears throat> yet what remains problematic is that we became so accustomed and this is what i was saying now to a mode of being that ex exists under the commands of the given laws uh, in in a way that these laws so the heteronomous laws and the heteronomous mode of life are now understood as natural phenomena. And this is something also, uh, this uh, notion of natural phenomenon is something which is used by Gastoriadis in the book I, that I mentioned earlier, The Imaginary Institution of Society. So uh, Gastoriadis says that Western thought and tradition became so accustomed uh, to live a heteronomous life that we arrive at a point where we think that heteronomy is a natural phenomenon, is not something that was socially constructed and, si and simply uh, conquered over uh, the autonomous potential. Is that that we think that this is this is the way and tough luck? This is how we live. It's a natural, natural phenomenon. So, for example, the idea of the social contract. I was uh, teaching a class uh, of first year undergraduates and we were doing hops, for example, and, and we say, yeah, of course, this is, this is the way we live. This is, this is nature, we are evil, whatever. So we can see how uh, a theory conquered over others and it is now uh, thought, at least from, from British uh, students in a British university as, you know, as a common sense, as something that it is the unquestionable truth, in a sense. And this is what Castoriadis uh, says about uh, heteronomy. And to a certain extent, this is what Stirner says about notions like justice, law, humanity, God, and so forth. Um, to that extent, what I'll try to do in the following, uh, in the following pages of my paper is to uh, use these two thinkers, as I said, in order to see how we can nothing the law, both as an, as an institution, as I said, but also as a source of hier hierarchical uh, and heteronomous values and commands. So in the first part, I will engage with Stirner's ferocious attack on the, sp of, uh, on the spooks, and in the second part, I will ex uh, expand further on Castoriadis' distinction between heteronomy and autonomy. So, uh, in the unique and its property, Stirner says that our head is haunted. So there is uh, a line that says, man, your head is haunted. And our head is haunted by fixed ideas or foundational moral principles. So Stirner starts uh, its critique by questioning the emancipatory promise of the Enlightenment. So, you know, Enlightenment is usually uh, considered to be at least, again, in Europe and in British University as this 
era of reason, uh, the era of liberation, the era where uh, when human beings uh, managed to achieve emancipation and to liberate themselves from uh, the absurd commands of, of the church and of God and so forth. For Stirner, this is not the, the truth, or at least this is not the whole story. Because, as I also mentioned earlier, we simply replaced God with a human being. So the centrality of the God was simply replaced by the centrality of the human instead of doing away completely with these higher uh, ideas. Uh, so according to him, the revolution of the humanity against God remained incomplete because even the most radical of the revolutionaries remain entrapped and in need of the highest essence to believe in. As he eloquently puts it, and I'm quoting, the atheists carry on their mockery of the higher essence, which also gets worshipped under the name of the highest or et supreme, and tumble one proof of its existence after another into the dust, without noticing that out of a need for a higher essence, they only destroy the old one to make room for uh, a new one. So even the atheists, or the most ferocious of them, they don't achieve, they didn't achieve much because according to him, they still need uh, to find a new, uh, a new uh, higher essence to believe in. And this, uh, just, uh, just to point out that this particular um, quote uh, is a direct critique to Feuerbach, if you are familiar with him, it's, an, it's another important figure or belonging to this group of the young Hegelians, influenced uh, uh, Marx's uh, critique of religion. Feuerbach, of course, was very critical of, of God, of the divine, but he was a strong supporter of this notion of humanity, and this is what Stirner finds problematic here. He says that even the most ferocious atheists are, in fact, unable to move beyond uh, a notion of the divine. Uh, so we have this replacement, as we said. And this replacement of, uh, of God with, with the human is, again, something that we, uh, that, we, uh, that we find in Nietzsche. So, for example, Nietzsche, in his gay science, as you know, he, uh, he says that God may be dead, and we have killed him, of course. But he says that given the way of men, there may still be caves for thousands of years in which his shadow will be shown. So even, uh, even despite the fact that we managed to you know, move beyond the, uh, the absurd and the and the commands of the church, we didn't go all the way, let's say. Uh, so, uh, what is problematic then with this over-reliance to these spooks and this fetishization of higher causes is that, is that it leads to an absolute form of alienation, and I'm using here the notion of alienation in a different manner from Marx, so uh, my understanding of alienation is very close to uh, the notion used by Tikkun uh, in their uh, theory of Bloom, mostly, if you're familiar with it, where uh, they talk about an existential kind of alienation. They use the term, if I'm not mistaken, uh, becoming, uh, becoming stranger or existential tourist. So you are here, but it is as if you are not here at all because you are, you are incapable of engaging actively with, it, with anything that's, that goes about in everyday life. You are simply an obedient, uh, one-dimensional subject, if we're going to use uh, Marcuse's uh, notion of uh, one-dimensionality, in a sense. Uh, so this is, this is mainly the problem, that we uh, expect everything 
from uh, external causes. And um, it's interestingly, we, we, uh, we see something similar uh, in Kropotkin and in his uh, short paper, Law and Authority, where he says that the main problem with law is in fact that we became so accustomed to expect everything from law that even the most uh, common things uh, we cannot do. So, for example, the road is completely empty, but if it doesn't turn, you know, the uh, if if the the green man doesn't appear, we don't cross the road because we became so accustomed to the rules and commands and everything that you know. It's, it's absurd if you think it. You know that the road is empty, but you still follow the commands of uh, of, of that particular uh, road, for example, or, yeah, the traffic, the traffic lights, and so forth. Okay. So uh, remaining entrapped into these higher courses. Uh, what we achieve is that, apart from the fact that we are, um, that we become alien and uh, easy um, uh, obedient, obedient subject, is that we uh, we understand, and this is something that I mentioned earlier, we understand these higher causes as natural phenomena. So they are uh, considered to be objectively true, objectively good, objectively moral, and so forth. So everyone that tries to uh, criticize these, uh, these uh, notions uh, is considered to be uh, an, uh, an inhuman, uh, an anti-human monster, name it, whatever you want. So. Uh, Again, I was I was talking to my students about the anti-humanist tradition in French philosophy, so Deleuze, Lyotard, um, Althusser, Foucault, uh, the death of man, and so forth. And they were like, how can they be anti-humanists? So they, they, that was their first, first reaction. Even the, the notion of anti-humanism, it's something that makes someone to, that makes someone to you know react in a in a bad way, you know, in a way that they think that they talk to a monster, or whatever. Or even, uh, and I think that that's from Alexandre Lefebvre, a guy who uh, engaged with Deleuze's uh, critique of human rights. Uh, he has a chapter where he says, no, Deleuze does not criticize uh, human rights uh, uh, per se, but rather he criticizes certain discourses of human rights because if we say that someone criticizes human rights per se, this is a monstrous proposition. And this is something that I, uh, I still remember because I found it, it was uh, one of the very first things that I read as when I was doing my PhD and something that I found extremely problematic. So he started the paper saying that you know, it, is, it is a monstrous proposition to criticize human rights per se, which I think is, is absurd. And, but it says also a lot about the ways that we think uh, for certain things, uh, the way that certain things became a common sense or natural, a natural phenomena. Okay, so, you know, this alienation, the fact that uh, we became accustomed to uh, obey to these spooks, to these higher causes, uh, leads to a condition a societal condition. So with Stirner, we have this discussion about the individual. But with Castoriadis, and this is another interesting uh, theme that fits together with and complements one another, uh, we have a discussion about the society as a whole. And I think that uh, this alienation of the, of the individual, of the singular, leads to what uh, Castoriadis identifies as uh, society's self-occultation. So he uses the, the notion of self-occultation. So society manages, and it is important to think that it is society that does so to itself, 
because uh, if we say if we say that, we immediately suggest that it is society itself that creates uh, its ways of functioning. It is not something external to society that creates our ways of being. But it is society itself that brought uh, these triumphants of, of heteronomy upon itself. It is society itself that managed to create these spooks, if we're going to use Stirner's, uh, Stirner's notion. And this, uh, this is very, um, very optimistic in, a, in an absurd way, because if we say that it is society that fucked up, we can also accept that society can, can do something to get away uh, from it, if okay, this again, this is a difficult task, as I will end up uh, stating in my conclusion. But again, there is some optimism. There is a way out because it is society that did it, or the the individual member of the society that did it. So, uh, Castoriadis' philosophical inquiry, inquiry places a significant importance on the capacity of the human to create and recreate the world and itself anew. So again, it is the human, it is the society that creates, it is not something external. The human being or the individual subject holds the potentiality for acting and creating ex nihilo. Just a short pause here. This very theological notion of ex nihilo in Castoriadis, it's a positive uh, potentiality belonging to uh, the human. It's not something that belongs to a higher entity. So, ironically, he uses this notion of ex nihilo out of nothing uh, in order to uh, say that the human being has the, the potentiality to create and recreate. But it is not a creation out of nothing. There is always something. Uh, there is a society here in Cyprus. There was a society before this society. There are other societies next to us. And there will be societies in the future and so forth. And these societies, the individuals belonging to these societies, they have the potentiality to create and recreate their world. Uh, so uh, it's, it's like uh, in Spinoza, for example. So we have this creative potential in, in Deleuze and in many other, in many other thinkers. Uh, but yeah, uh, Castoriadis uh, uses this uh, theological notion of ex nihilo. Uh, and it is something that we first uh, see in his, uh, one of his early papers from 1964, titled Marxism and Revolutionary Theory. And it, uh, according to him, uh, the creation ex nihilo is a central component of the instituting society and instituted society of the social imaginary of the institution of society as its own work of the social historical as a mode of Greek. So in other words, it's a central component uh, because we, uh, if, we, if we think that we have the potentiality to create and recreate, it means that uh, we understand that we, uh, that we have this ability to change things. And this is the revolutionary potential, according to him, or the central component of, revo of a revolutionary theory, according to him, in that, in that every paper. And as we will see, this is a starting point that leads him to uh, build up and develop this theory of autonomy. Because autonomy, and I mentioned earlier, a short quote, is this ability to create our own ways of being and thinking, our own nomi, as he says. Uh, but despite this potential of the human being to create ex nihilo, uh, Western thought has neglected it or forgotten it, according to Castoriadis. Western thought has instead thought the creation ex nihilo as a theological attribute and the ability of the divine to create life out of the void. So, uh, this notion of creation ex nihilo is reduced to an untemporal, ahistorical, 
understanding of the creative potential. Whereas in reality for Castoriadis, this is the definition of the social historical. But of course, for uh, theology and uh, in particular uh, Christian and mostly Christian Orthodox tradition that I'm familiar with, uh, creation ex nihilo is an ahistorical thing. So the divine creates out of nothing. And this creation of the divine is eternal. So the world is eternal because there is no history. We don't have a you know, starting point. It's point zero, let's say. Uh, if something is created, then it is there forever. Uh, <clears throat> so this uh, this attribution of the creation ex nihilo to the external higher, higher being is the first step towards the self-occultation of the society that leads to the formation of the heteronomous societies that we live in. So this is because the creative potential of the society becomes other or alien. So again, this notion of alienation, it is something that we see both in Stirner and Castoriadis. Uh, so yeah, the, um, the potential becomes, the, the potential of creation becomes alien to society itself. Uh, it becomes its other, hence the notion of heteronomy. So heteros or heteros in Greek means other, where, uh, autonomous or aftos means the self so something that belongs to you so heteros the other uh, auto autonomia something that belongs to to you we have uh, so as castoriade states and i'm quoting in heteronomous societies and this is important this is very important that is to say in the overwhelming majority of societies which have existed up to the present time almost all of them, we find institutionally established and sanctioned the representation of a source of the instituting of society that only can be found outside of this society, among the gods, in God, among the ancestors, in the laws of nature, in the laws of reason, in the laws of history, end of quote. So we have, uh, in this quote, uh, uh, we have two fundamental questions. First one is that, uh, what is the relationship between the society and the ability of human being to self-alter and to recreate it? And secondly, and if we follow Castoriadis and accept that the societies that exist and have existed so far are in their majority understood as heteronomous one, then how can we conceive of an autonomous society? Can we ever see the emergence of such a society? So. In this quote, Castoriadis tells us that, in fact, the majority, if not all of the societies that ever existed and that exist, are heteronomous societies. Then, of course, the first question is that, can we then have an autonomous society, or is it impossible? Or is it just you know, a theoretical um, um, uh, hypothesis? Uh, and the other thing, of course, is the relationship between the society and the human being, or the subject that belong to them, a member, a singular member of that society. So regarding the question about the relationship between society and its members, Castoriadis explains that the formation of a society, its continuity and the nexus that brings it together is interconnected with a central problem to the notion of autonomy, namely the way that one human being relates to another. So the creation, the institution of the society, the imaginary of the society, that is the way that society thinks about itself and about uh, the nexus that brings it together, uh, relates to the autonomy of the individual members that belong to this society. And what do we mean by that? Because autonomy for Castoriadis means that we have the ability to create and recreate our ways of being. Immediately, if we uh, if we embrace this uh, creative potential, it means that the, the relationship between us and other members of the society will, um, will be uh, described by this autonomous potential. So immediately the society that we form will be characterized as an autonomous society. 
But because now our social relations are dictated by heteronomy or by the blind obedience, going back to Stirner, to the spooks, immediately the societies that we form are characterized as heteronomous, according to Castorias. So it is us and our creative potential that uh, create and recreate the societies that we live in. So there is an immediate connection between the individual member and society itself. This is the answer to the, to the first question in relation to the quote. Regarding the second question now, can we have an autonomous society? For Castoriadis, and this is for me quite troubling, there was in time a, a, an autonomous society. And for him, that was uh, the ancient uh, state of Athens or the ancient polis of Athens. I'm not sure about it, to be honest. I think uh, perhaps, and this is something that uh, I think he was criticized by uh, scholars engaging with um, critiques of Western tradition. I think that in that point, Castoriadis is still very much uh, influenced by uh, the, the traditions of the West, that they think in a very fond way about ancient Greece, about what ancient Greece offered to Western tradition. Okay, yeah, of course, we need to uh, go back and see how philosophy emerged and so forth, but on the other hand, we need to acknowledge certain issues that uh, existed in these societies. And I'm not sure how Castoriadis uh, or why Castoriadis ended up thinking that ancient, the ancient city-state or polis of Athens was the, was the only autonomous society. I think that's a very Western, let's say, take on what, what, what is going on, or what was going on in the world. But anyway, the point is, at least for, our, for my purposes and for, for the purposes of, the, of this research is to, uh, is to see that uh, there is a potential for autonomous societies. It is not a mere theoretical uh, hypothesis, but it is something that can be uh, materially understood and uh, conceived in a sense. And this is again, another optimistic point in this kind of pessimistic uh, um, diagnosis that I, that, I, that I offer here. So, uh, uh, yeah, he says, Castoriadis says that all the, all the, society, all the most societies that existed trust, uh, place their trust to something which is external to them legislators, rights, gods, morality, good, a notion of citizenship, the law, of course, and all of these things. Uh, and in that way, because the creation of society is a historical thing, according to him, and I think in that point he's right, and because throughout our history, our societies are characterized by this uh, blind uh, trust and blind obedience to heteronomy, we ended up at a point where we think that heteronomy is our reality or our only reality. And it becomes even more difficult to, uh, to criticize that or think of an alternative. So, uh, and especially so after the many defeats of the left, of anarchist circles of movements and so forth. One example is, of course, the uh, the social the social movements defeats in Greece. But again, I'm using Greece because I'm quite familiar with the examples there. In 2015, for example, um, 
after the election of the so-called radical left party in power, uh, we saw how they gradually became part of the system and they, uh, and they caused a huge blow to the left as such because uh, the right wingers now in Greece they say okay this is this is the left this is this is what you get if you if you uh, if you have the left in power in a sense uh, you get something very very similar to us but because we are professional politicians uh, vote for us and we can do these things better you know we are the serious guys you have your um uh, infantile childish revolution now we can get back to uh what we got used to uh the idea that we have the two parties in power exchanging power and then mm, doing their usual stuff and that was a huge defeat for progressive movements the left uh, even anarchist circles that okay they didn't they didn't believe that parliamentary uh, elections will lead to the ultimate emancipation. Of course, I mean, if you if you are serious about these things, nobody nobody who was serious about these things believed that. But uh, they couldn't uh, they couldn't they couldn't anticipate this very huge blow that uh, that the left and the progressive suffered because of the fact that the so-called radical left party became again part of the system so we saw again and, and, and in fact the justification of the party for legislating certain issues was that we don't have another choice which is a very common uh, excuse that we get from people uh, basing their trust to this heteronomous way of thinking in a sense that this is how things are or we didn't know that before we got into power or we did that because uh, these are uh, these are the conditions and you know all these things or we need to we need to understand the conditions one simple answer to that is that if you uh, if you don't agree with it you can leave and you say okay there is no other choice but at least i left because you know i cannot legislate something that uh, leads uh, thousands of people to poverty just because there is no other way out or this is this is the natural state of things in a sense so this is a very heteronomous way of arguing and thinking in a sense Okay, so to that extent, uh, because Western thought have forgotten the creative potential of each of each one of us, and because we attributed this ability of creating ex nihilo uh, to a theological uh, higher being or entity, uh, we have, of course, forgotten our creative potential. So living in heteronomous societies, the human being places its trust and ability to think and act on forces external to it. And it is something also, this concept of forces, is it's, it is something that we have external or reactive forces. It is something that we also see in Nietzsche and in Deleuze, where he discusses uh, in, his, in his book, Nietzsche and Philosophy, where he talks about reactive forces. Uh, so gradually the western human being and i'm referring to the western human being because this notion of the heteronomy is something that defines western societies and i want to be uh, just with other societies that i'm not quite familiar with it, with, it, with them to be honest uh, so uh, yeah the, this heteronomy gradually turns the, the Western subject into an obedient subject or a one-dimensional subject, as I mentioned earlier. And it is within this framework that the law is other to the human. So the law is heteronomous. So whether other 
and nomos law. So you can see the etym etymologically how this heteronomy relates to the notion of law. Othering or a law that is other or an othering law, heteronomous. Uh, so the individual is always in a process of an intensified self-occultation. So the self-occultation of the individual leads to the self-occultation of the society and vice versa. Okay, so, uh, but despite that, we should not forget, and this is why I mentioned that Castoriadis uh, understands that there was a point where an autonomous society existed, there is always this radical potential of, uh, of rupture, of rupturing the, uh, the triumphant, the triumph and, uh, uh, and the, conquer, uh, the conquering of, of, uh, of heteronomy. And this radical potential is for Castoriadis, this autonomous potential of what I call uh, the destituent pole. And this is the final uh, part of my paper. So the answer of Stirner against the dominance of the spook is egoism. He says that his egoism, as I mentioned earlier, is not a mundane individualism of the bourgeois class or political liberalism and neoliberalism, but rather, uh, and of course it is not a narcissistic self-interest, but rather this egoism is a call to the uniqueness or ownness. So again, Stirner uses this notion of property in a very interesting manner. He's against this idea of private property of the bourgeois class of his time. But again, he, 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 he appropriates the notion of property in order to use it to define the egoist individual in this notion of ownness or, uh, or property. So owning oneself in a sense, or nothing what is external to you. This is the egoist of Stirling. Uh, and to that extent, the way I understand it is like a persona. So the egoist is not the individual human being per se, but rather is a persona. It's a char character which is used in order to explain a, a, a mode of being in words. So how can you explain the way that we should live in words through this notion of the egoist or the person who is autonomous? who owns what is, uh, what is part of itself rather than external to it. Uh, and of course, this is uh, the relation with Soriadi's notion of autonomy, but also the relationship uh, between ownness or egoism, autonomy and destitution. And why is that? Because the institution is this call for nothing, our masters, in a sense. Everything that is external to us. And I'm using uh, the passage uh, from, uh, from the Invincible Committee, uh, from the book now, where they say, and I'm quoting, destituere in Latin means to place standing separate raise up in, in, in isolation, to abandon, put aside, let drop, knock down, to let down, deceive. Whereas constituent logic crashes against the power apparatus, it means to take control of it. So constituent power means to replace one power with another. This is not part of the quotation, this is something that I'm saying. Uh, but on the other hand, the destituent potential, and again I'm quoting, is concerned instead with escaping from it. So escaping from this uh, necessity to replace power with power. So this destituent call is a call to do away with power as such, with any source or sort, sort of power, of higher, higher power. Uh, with removing any hold on it 
uh, which the apparatus might have as it increases its hold on the world in the separate space that it forms. Its characteristics, so the characteristics of the, the, the student potential, uh, its characteristic gesture is existing just as the typical constituent gesture is taken by storm. Thus, where the constituents place themselves in a dialectical relation of struggle with the ruling authority in order to take possession of it. So again, we have perhaps here a critique of the Hegelian uh, dialectic, where we also see in Stirner the fact that in order in constituent potential, we need to define ourselves through our opposition to the ruling class, for example and through the um, clash between the thesis and the antithesis we have a new synthesis so a new form of power through hegelian dialectics in uh, this decision potential we start by defining ourselves so we don't need the ruling or any higher cause in order to define ourselves again it is something similar that Deleuze does in his Nietzsche book where he says that the problem with the Hegelian dialectic is in fact uh, uh, what Nietzsche um, says about uh, the slave morality of the, of the birds of prey and the herd. So the herd uh, mentality says that uh, the birds of prey are evil, so because they, they eat us, so we are the good ones. So the herd uh, defines itself through its opposition to the external cause, the, the birds of prey. Whereas birds of prey, the aristocratic kind of thinking for Nietzsche, uh, is self-sufficient. It doesn't need the herd in order to define itself. So the birds of prey say, okay, this is the way that we live. We eat sheep. It's not that we are bad, it's not that they are bad and we are the good ones, or it's not that we are the good ones or the most powerful ones, but simply this is how things are. This is our food, in a sense. And this is the problem that uh, Deleuze identifies via Nietzsche with the Hegelian dialectic. In the Hegelian dialectic, we still need the outside in order to define ourselves and perhaps this is what the invisible committee does here in the critique of the constituent potential uh, but the, the deciduent potential doesn't need an externality in order to define its potentiality or uh, it doesn't rely on uh, rely on this on 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 the existence of power on the existence of hierarchy so it is anarchic in the sense that it, it, it wants or it calls for a total uh, dissolution of any form of hierarchy. Um, <clears throat> yeah, or yeah, or it's yeah, this, this, uh, this abandonment or this engaging, uh, which I find quite interesting. So, uh, yeah. Uh, the, the, again, I'm going back to the quotation and I'm finishing with, with it. Uh, the decidument logic obeys the vital need to disengage from authority. It doesn't abandon the struggle, so again, it is not a call to nihilism, but it rather fastens onto the struggle's positivity. So it is positive, it is active, because again, it doesn't define itself through its opposite but rather it is there and it is there and it is ready to fight rather than you know, to say we cannot do anything about things. And end of quote. And to, uh, to conclude, abandoning or disengaging with the commands of the law and any higher values is a paramount step, step and a decisive action against the external forces that dictate every aspect of our psyche. Losing interest and nothing our certainties shall pave the way for finding one another. So we need to find one another in a sense that we need to engage differently with, uh, with uh, fellow uh, human beings uh, and other of course, beings uh, and the world around us. 
and our unique creative potentiality. So we need to find again this forgotten, let's say, creative potentiality. Uh, but in order to do that, we also need to lose something. And this something that we need to lose is our certainties. So we need to lose interest for the happy jewel. So we need to get out of our com comfort zone, let's say. And this is at least, uh, for me, the, the ultimate call for destitution. And perhaps this call for destitution uh, is in a position to open up new ways of experimenting with different modes of being and thinking. And it is in this case that I understand the procedure as a strife towards an autonomous nothing. And this autonomous nothing is, again, this effort to nothing our masters. Uh, and it, in order to uh, try to do that, if it cannot manage to achieve its aims, it needs to be without predetermined origins. So we don't have to go back and try to identify origins because every time that we try to identify origins, we end up with a new hierarchy, identity. So we don't, again, need a pure form of identity, of course, or an endpoint. So I mentioned perhaps wrongly the word aims. Perhaps uh, maybe, maybe we don't have a better word but we don't have an endpoint. We don't say that, okay, the revolution will take place and a new kind of society will be formed. This is not you know, the, the, uh, the point of the, of the concept or the call of the destitution. Perhaps the first thing is to have the courage to disengage with the habitual, which is difficult in a sense. I mean, it may sound easy, but it is difficult to, to say that or to think that, well, in certain situations, the things, uh, things might, might be different, or things are the way they are, not because this is uh, the natural, um, their natural cause, their natural, they're not natural phenomena, but rather because there is a long history behind, uh, behind everything that happened. And we may trace this, historical or um, um, archaeological in a Foltian way um, understanding of, of what happened and what led to you know, the formation of uh, our current social relations and, and so forth. Uh, and of course, in our troubling times, such a destitution of what we have what we came to know as unquestionable and ultimately uh, came to hate is necessary, I think. So, again, uh, this notion of hatred is something that interests me a lot and I would like to uh, expand uh, more on it because I think it has something to add to this uh, call of destitution. So the fact that we we need to embrace the fact that we, we came to a point where we hate this habitual. The fact that uh, from, from the everyday uh, femicides that we see in the Greek society, for example, every day for the last uh, two or three years, which it, it became a habit, or the sexist behavior in the streets, in, in the office, everywhere. So it's, it's this habitual which for many it's common sense and this is this is the sad part in a sense that we need to you know embrace this hatred and try to to destitute in a sense okay thank you that's all from me hopefully it wasn't that tiresome <laughs> thank you